The final days and the agonising death of Frederick III. Frederick III, also known as Fritz, was a captivating figure in German history. Born into a family deeply rooted in military tradition, he surprised many with his distaste for warfare, despite his remarkable leadership and triumph in various conflicts. As the only son of Emperor Wilhelm I, Frederick was groomed for a life of military service, but he harboured a genuine aversion to the horrors of war, earning praise for his compassionate conduct from both allies and foes. In 1888, during the tumultuous year of the three emperors, Frederick ascended to the throne as German Emperor and King of Prussia. This brief reign of only 99 days followed the passing of his father, who had played a pivotal role in the unification of Germany. Unfortunately, Frederick's time as ruler was overshadowed with his Battle of Cancer, which ultimately led to his premature demise at the age of 56, despite futile medical treatments. Frederick's marriage to Victoria, Princess Royal, an eldest child of Queen Victoria of the United Kingdom, was a union of like-minded souls. United by their liberal ideals, they championed the cause of greater representation for commoners in government. Despite his conservative upbringing, Frederick's exposure to British influences and his education of the University of Bonn had cultivated his liberal inclinations. He frequently clashed with the staunchly conservative Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, openly opposing his policies and advocating for check on the Chancellor's authority. Liberals in both Germany and Britain hoped that Frederick's reign would usher in a wave of liberalisation within the German Empire. The royal couple, deeply inspired by Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband, envisioned a joint rule akin to Victoria's parents and aimed to rectify what they perceived as flaws in Bismarck's autocratic system. They planned to replace the office of Chancellor with a British-style cabinet, where ministers would be accountable to the Reichstag rather than the emperor alone. The cabinet's decisions would be based on consensus shaping government policy. Frederick often referred to the imperial constitution as ingenuously contrived chaos, reflecting his desire for a more balanced and democratic governance structure. However, Frederick's illness hindered his ability to implement these reforms effectively and his limited actions were later abandoned by his son and successor, Wilhelm II. The timing of Frederick's untimely demise and the brevity of his reign have long intrigued historians, as they ponder the potential turning point in German history his continued leadership could have represented. The question of whether Frederick would have steered the German Empire towards a more liberal path remains a captivating a subject of debate among scholars. Morrill Mackenzie, a prominent British cancer specialist, found himself at the centre of controversy due to his treatment of Frederick. The Crown Prince had long been a heavy smoker, and his persistent hoarseness raised concerns about his health. Frederick sought medical assistance and underwent a series of procedures, including scraping the vocal cords and cauterisation, in an attempt to address the thickened tissue and growth on his larynx. Eventually, a diagnosis of laryngeal cancer was made by Ernest von Bergmann and confirmed by Mackenzie after his arrival in Berlin. While Victoria, Frederick's wife, was informed of the urgent need for operation, Frederick himself remained unaware. The doctors held hope that the growth might be benign, but Mackenzie recommended a biopsy to determine its nature. The renowned pathologist Rudolf Verko examined the tissue samples but found no evidence of cancerous cells, leading Mackenzie to oppose the idea of removing it completely, considering it fatal. He assured Frederick and the others involved that the Crown Prince would fully recover in a matter of months. Differing opinions emerged among the medical professionals involved, while Mackenzie, Gerhardt and Wegner supported his stance, Bergman and Toybold maintained their initial diagnosis of cancer. Bismarck, the influential Chancellor, also opposed a major operation and urged the Kaiser to veto it. Mackenzie performed another biopsy, with Verco again unable to detect cancerous cells. This gave further support to Mackenzie's position, and in June, Frederick left Potsdam to attend his mother-in-law's Golden Jubilee in London and consult with Mackenzie. 
Sadly, he never saw his father again, and Mackenzie operated on Frederick, removing a significant portion of the growth, and the Crown Prince spent July with his family. However, during a follow-up examination in August, the growth reappeared, prompting cauterization and raising concerns of malignancy. Felix Seaman, a respected German throat specialist, criticised Mackenzie's cauterizations and expressed doubt about the nature of the growth, recommending continued biopsies and examinations. Frederick sought further medical attention, travelling to the Scottish Highlands with Dr Mark Hovell. Although subsequent examinations showed no signs of reoccurrence, Frederick still felt that something was amiss internally. Nonetheless, he requested that Queen Victoria to knight Mackenzie, who was honoured with a knighthood in September. The controversy surrounding Mackenzie's treatment and the reoccurrence of the growth added to the intrigue surrounding Frederick's condition and the subsequent discussions among medical professionals. Despite undergoing throat operations and seeking relief at cows, Frederick's hoarseness persisted, prompting Mackenzie to suggest spending the winter on the Italian Riviera. In August, upon hearing of his father's deteriorating health, Frederick contemplated returning to Germany, but was convinced by his wife to go to the South Tyrol. However, when he arrived in Toblach on the 7th of September, he was exhausted and still plagued by hoarseness. The lack of improvement in Frederick's condition worried Philip, Prince of Eulenburg, who consulted the renowned laryngologist Max Joseph Hortel. Hortel advocated for a comprehensive and radical throat operation, suspecting a benign tumour that could potentially turn malignant. Criticism of Mackenzie's treatment of Frederick was mounting at this time. After spending a fortnight in Toblach, Mackenzie arrived to re-examine Frederick, who continued to suffer from colds and hoarseness. Publicly, Mackenzie downplayed the concerns and attributed his coarseness to a mere momentary chill. Nevertheless, he advised Frederick to leave Toblach for Venice, accompanied by Victoria. Once in Venice, Frederick caught another cold, further alarming Mackenzie. He noticed ongoing swelling in Frederick's throat and warned the Crown Prince against speaking at length. Mackenzie cautioned that, if Frederick persisted in speaking and contracted additional colds, he would give him no more than three months to live. At the beginning of October, Victoria reported that Frederick's throat was not causing immediate worry as he was taking more care and speaking much less. On the 6th of October, Frederick, accompanied by his family and Mackenzie, relocated to a villa in Bavino on Lake Maggiore. Mackenzie left on the 8th of October predicting Frederick's recovery within three to four months. Their son Wilhelm joined them for Frederick's 56th birthday on the 18th of October. However, by the end of October, Frederick's condition suddenly deteriorated. Victoria informed her mother on the 2nd of November that Frederick's throat was inflamed again, unrelated to the cold, and that he was experiencing increased hoarseness and feelings of depression about his health. General Alfred von Valdesee recognised the grave implications of Frederick's declining health, considering the possibility of William's imminent death and his son's accession. A new Kaiser, unable to speak, would be practically impossible, and there was a pressing need for an energetic leader. Wilhelm reported to King Albert of Saxony that his father's temperament had become irritable, although his voice showed slight improvement. Frederick's throat was being treated with a powder blown in twice a day to soothe the larynx, according to Wilhelm's account. On the 3rd of November, Frederick embarked on a journey to San Remo, accompanied by his entourage. However, his condition took a turn for the worst. Two days later, on the 5th of November, Frederick lost his voice completely and experienced excruciating pain in his throat. Dr. Hover conducted an examination and made a distressing discovery, a new growth under Frederick's left vocal cord. The news caused great alarm among William and the German government. The following day, Mackenzie issued a bulletin acknowledging the unfavourable development in Frederick's illness. He sought advice from other specialists, including Professor Leopold Schnotter. 
an Austrian expert in laryngology, and Dr. Hermann Kroz from Berlin. On the 9th of November, the pair delivered the devastating diagnosis. The new growth was malignant, and it was highly unlikely that Frederick would survive another year. All of the attending doctors, including Mackenzie, now agreed that Frederick was indeed suffering from laryngeal cancer. Additional lesions had appeared on the right side of his larynx, leaving no doubt about the urgency of the situation. One of the doctors later revealed that the early growths discovered in May were also cancerous. Frederick was shattered by the news, breaking down in tears upon hearing it from Mackenzie. He lamented the cruel fate bestowed upon him, expressing his disappointment at being afflicted with such a horrific and repulsive illness. He had hoped to contribute to his country and questioned why fate had been so unkind to him. In a private conversation with his wife, Frederick made the difficult decision to reject the proposed total laryngectomy due to its high risk. He provided a written statement to his doctors, declaring that he would remain in Italy and only consider the operation if his condition deteriorated to the point of suffocation. The news of Frederick's diagnosis sent shockwaves through Berlin, fueling animosity towards Victoria, who was perceived as a controlling foreigner, manipulating her husband. Some politicians even suggested that Frederick should be bypassed in the line of succession in favour of his son Wilhelm. However, Bismarck firmly asserted that Fredericks would ascend to the throne regardless of his illness, and any determination regarding his ability to fulfil his duties would be made according to the relevant provisions of the Prussian constitution. Despite the renewed confirmation of cancer, Frederick's condition showed signs of improvement after the 5th of November, giving rise to a glimpse of hope. Both Frederick and Victoria maintained their trust in Mackenzie, who conducted several re-examinations of Frederick's throat in December and provided a positive prognosis, raising doubts about the cancerous nature of the growths. As the new year 1888 approached, there was still a lingering possibility that the initial diagnosis might have been incorrect. In a cruel twist of fate, Frederick's hopes for improvement were dashed when his chronic catarrh took a sudden turn for the worse. On the 26th of December 1887, he expressed optimism in his writings, believing that he was on the path to recovery and eager to prove himself worthy of his responsibilities. However, only a week later, on the 5th of January 1888, the swelling under his left vocal cord returned, accompanied by inflammation on the previously unaffected side of his throat. Frederick's condition deteriorated rapidly as he battled high fevers, violent coughing fits and laboured breathing. The doctors diagnosed him with an infection of the throat membrane, rendering him unable to speak once again. Insomnia and excruciating headaches plagued him, casting a dark shadow over his days and nights. In a desperate attempt to provide relief, Mackenzie, upon his return from Spain, recommended an immediate operation. The operation took place on the 8th of February 1888, as Frederick endured relentless bouts of suffocation and sleeplessness. A tracheal tube was inserted to enable his breathing, but it came at a heavy cost. Frederick lost his ability to speak, forever silenced by the procedure, and had to rely on written communication from that point forward. The operation itself was fraught with danger, as Bergman, in a terrifying moment, almost caused Frederick's demise by mistakenly placing the cannula in the wrong position. Bleeding and coffin and shoot, leading to an abscess in Frederick's neck that plagued him with discomfort for the remaining months of his life. Filled with confusion and frustration, Frederick questioned the actions of Bergman and lamented the mistreatment he believed he had suffered. Even after the operation, Frederick's health continued to deteriorate. High fevers, debilitating headaches and persistent insomnia persisted. Violent coughing fits became a regular occurrence with blood-stained sputum accompanying them. The other doctors led by Bergman now firmly believed that Frederick's condition was indeed cancer, potentially spreading to his lungs. 
Confirmation of the diagnosis came on the 6th of March, when Professor Wilhelm Waldier, an, an anatomist who had arrived in San Remo, examined Frederick's sputum under a microscope. His findings revealed the presence of cancerous bodies, confirming the existence of a cancerous growth in the larynx. Whilst this diagnosis settled the question, it cast doubt on Mackenzie's treatment methods, causing ongoing medical controversy for years to come, as the diagnosis and treatment of Frederick's fatal illness remained a subject of debate well into the next century. In a dramatic turn of events just three days after Frederick's cancer diagnosis, his father, Emperor William I, passed away at the age of 90 on the 9th of March, 1888. As the eldest son, Frederick ascended to the throne, becoming the German Emperor and King of Prussia. The news of his father's death was telegraphed to Frederick in Italy by his son, Crown Prince Wilhelm, who would now take on the role of his father's messenger. Upon receiving the news, Frederick reflected in his diary about the weight of his new responsibilities and his determination to, to fulfil his duties for the well-being of his country. The transition of power raised hopes among the progressive fractions in Germany, who believed that Frederick's reign would bring about a new era of liberal governance. There was a question about what name Frederick would choose as the new emperor. Logically, he could have taken the name Frederick I or Frederick IV, depending on the perspective of the Emperor's continuity. However, he decided to retain the name as King of Prussia, following the advice of Bismarck to avoid legal complications. On the night of the 11th of March, Frederick arrived in Berlin, but his appearance shocked those who saw him due to his frail condition. The focus now shifted to how much longer he would live and what he would hope to achieve in his limited time as Emperor. Despite his illness, Frederick made efforts to fulfil his duties as emperor. In a poignant moment, he symbolically transferred the Order of the Black Eagle from his uniform to his wife's dress, honouring her position as empress. Although too weak to participate in his father's funeral procession, he watched from his room in the palace, overcome with emotion. During his short reign, Frederick received official visits from Queen Victoria of the United Kingdom and King Oscar II of Sweden and Norway. He also attended the wedding of his son, Prince Henry, to his niece, Princess Irene. However, his time on the throne lasted only 99 days and his ability to bring about lasting change was limited. Many in the German ruling elite saw his reign as a temporary period before his son, Wilhelm II's accession to power. Although Frederick had tried to restrict the powers of the Chancellor and monarch under the Constitution, it was never implemented. Nonetheless, he did force a resignation of Robert von Puttemer as Prussian Minister of the Interior in June, after evidence of election interference came to light. Dr Mackenzie noted Frederick's deep sense of responsibility in fulfilling his position's duties. Empress Victoria, in a letter to Lord Napier, described Frederick's challenges in managing his affairs without the ability to speak, calling it a trying experience. Despite his favour, Frederick lamented in May 1888, and he could not succumb to his illness, fearing the consequences for Germany. In a tragic turn of events, though, Frederick's health rapidly declined from April 1888 onwards, rendering him too weak to even walk. He was confined to his bed, where his persistent coffin expelled copious amounts of pus. The cancer, relentless in its advance, eventually reached and punctured his esophagus in early June, rendering him unable to eat. He endured episodes of vomited and suffered from high fevers, yet his mind remained alert enough for him to pen a final entry in his diary on the 11th of June where he expressed his confusion and determination to recover, as he still had so much to accomplish. However, Frederick III's valiant battle came to an end on the 15th of June 1888, as he passed away at 11.30am in Potsdam. He was succeeded by his 29-year-old son, Wilhelm II, who would inherit the throne. Frederick III was laid to rest in a mausoleum connected to the Friedensgard, in Potsdam, marking the final resting place of this influential figure.
Queen Victoria's first child, her daughter, Princess Victoria, went to agonising lengths to make her mother proud and impress her, and she became an Empress of Prussia. Princess Victoria was able to rise very high, but her life ended with a giant crash. Victoria was born a disappointment. She was born to the young Queen and her husband, Albert, on the 21st of November, 1840. Queen Victoria had written in her letters that if the baby was born a girl, that she would drown the babe. So when she gave birth to her first child, who was a daughter, she was deeply disappointed. Even the doctor delivering the baby knew of the profound disappointment when he announced that the Queen had sadly had a girl. This was already a bad start considering she wished for a boy immediately after birth and when she said, don't worry, the next one will be a boy. When she grew up, she went on to have issues with her mother, Queen Victoria, and in a cruel twist of fate, as the year 1899 unfolded, Victoria embarked on a journey to Balmoral, seeking solace and the warmth of her mother's embrace. Little did she know that the path she treaded upon would lead her into the clutches of an insidious adversary, inoperable breast cancer. The diagnosis struck like lightning, shattering the fragile semblance of her well-being, leaving her grappling with the weight of her mortality. The veil of invincibility had been ripped away, exposing the vulnerability of a woman whose strength had weathered countless storms. From that moment forward, her life would forever be marked by the relentless grip of an unyielding foe. In her final days, Empress Frederick endured the relentless grip of her deteriorating health, grappling with the physical and emotional toll of her battle with inoperable breast cancer. The burden of her illness cast a shadow over her existence, shaping the landscape of her remaining moments. Confined to the confines of her bed, she experienced a profound frailty that contrasted sharply with the strength and vitality that she once possessed. Pain wrecked her body as cancer's relentless progression spread into tentrils, invading her once vibrant spirit. Yet even in the face of her suffering, she sought solace and simple pleasures. In the quiet morning, she would summon the strength to rise, her weakened form finding respite in gentle walks, perhaps seeking a fleeting connection with the world beyond her chamber. Throughout the long hours that stretched ahead, she immersed herself in writing word, finding solace and letters penned to loved ones or escaping into realms of literature. The library of her castle became her sanctuary, a refuge from the harsh realities that encircled her. Within its hallowed walls, she sought solace and embarked on intellectual journeys, losing herself in the pages that transported her beyond the confines of her ailing body. Yet even as she savoured these fleeting moments of respite, the spectre of mortality loomed over closer. A weighty concern gripped her heart as she fretted over the future of Germany under the reign of her son. With great urgency, she orchestrated a clandestine operation to safeguard her personal letters, ensuring their return to Great Britain, away from prying eyes and political repercussions. And so, as her final days unravelled, a complex tapestry of pain, reflection and fervent love surrounded Empress Frederick. Her spirit flickered in the fading light, clinging to the last parts of life, and on that fateful day of the 5th of August 1901, her battle came to an end, as the candle of her existence was extinguished, leaving behind a legacy etched in the annals of history. In her final years, Empress Frederick immersed herself in the world of art, frequenting the vibrant artist colony of Kronberg and forming a close bond with painter Norbert. Despite her declining health, she maintained a routine of morning walks and spent hours writing letters or indulging in reading within the castle's library. However, in late 1898, her world turned dark as doctors delivered the devastating news of inoperable breast cancer. Confined to her bed for prolonged periods, she faced the agony of the disease spreading to her spine by autumn of 1900. The breast cancer was inoperable, as the medical advancements and treatment options for cancer in the late 19th century were very limited compared to what is available today. 
Surgical removal of the affected tissue, such as a mastectomy, was one of the primary approaches at the time. However, the understanding of cancer and the effectiveness of treatments were not as advanced as they were now. And her battle with cancer took place during a time when cancer treatment options were very limited and the disease was often difficult to manage. Her struggle with cancer and her subsequent passing highlight the challenges faced by individuals fighting the disease during that era. Fearing that her personal letters would fall into the wrong hands, particularly those expressing concerns about Germany's future under her son, she orchestrated an operation. Her godson, Frederick Ponzumbi, retrieved the letters, covertly returning them to Great Britain. He later edited and provided commentary on the letters, ultimately publishing them in 1928. Tragically, on the 5th of August 1901, the Empress Dowager breathed her last breath, mere months after her mother's passing. She found her final resting place beside her husband in the Grand Royal Mausoleum in Potsdam. Adorning her tomb is a majestic marble effigy, depicting her lying in eternal repose. Within the same hallowed grounds, her two deceased sons, Sigismund and Waldemar, rest alongside her. In a poignant display of reverence and mourning, the grand funeral of Empress Victoria unfolded, shrouded in sombre aura. The world stood witness to the solemn proceedings, compelled by the weight of her extraordinary life and untimely passing. The mausoleum in Potsdam became a sanctuary of sorrow, housing the royal mausoleum where the Empress Dowager's final resting place awaited. With bated breath, the assembly gathered, family, dignitaries and mourners alike, united in their shared grief, paying homage to a remarkable woman. Within the hallowed walls, the air grew heavy and heartache as the ceremony commenced. Enveloped in sacred rituals and religious rites, the Empress Dowager was laid to rest alongside her beloved husband and her cherished sons. Amidst the flickering candles and the scent of incense, the marble effigy of Empress Victoria stood as a silent witness to her eternal slumber, a poignant reminder of her enduring presence in the annals of history. Her passing left a giant void, a palpable absence felt by all who had known her spirit. Yet within the depths of their collective grief, the mourners found solace, cherishing her legacy and finding strength in the memories of her extraordinary life. Princess Victoria, the Princess Royal, had a significant legacy as a member of the British royal family. Her marriage to Crown Prince Frederick of Prussia strengthened ties between the British and German monarchies, and despite her declining health, she attended her mother Queen Victoria's funeral. Princess Victoria's philanthropic work, support of the arts and diplomatic role influenced European monarchies. Her advocacy for healthcare, education and social welfare positively impacted society. And her title, family connections and contributions to European history leave a lasting imprint. Princess Victoria's legacy is one of royal duty, cultural patronage and a dedication to societal well-being.